quoting a price on you. You'd better take a vacation. Why'd you hear? It's all around. I picked up bits here and there. What are you gonna do? That's what I've been doing anymore. Are you trying to... Are you trying to get yourself killed, Leonard? Well, Brown doesn't kill to get what he wants. He buys. Then you'd better sell out or start running. With all the ballyhoo around the big-budget WB film noir featuring the bogeys and the bacalls, it's easy to forget that film noir was built by B-movies, and none of them looms larger than the big combo, sporting decidedly non-noir conceits like mob bosses, enforcers, and such, which while very much a part of modern parody of noir are in actuality a rarity for classic examples of the genre, the big combo on paper is little more than a functional crime film. Why the working title, and even the title in foreign territories, was often some vacuous variant of the criminal organization or some such, a sordid depiction of the dying days of a post-bootleg era crime cabal delineated in large procedural fashion, not at all unlike the previous painterly job done by the very same film cinematographer John Alton on the harrowing He Walked by Night, where it takes flight to the farthest peaks of film noir masterpieces like Murder My Sweet or The Big Sleep is with the addition of John Alton's atrementous inkwash cinematography, Joseph Lewis's staggering sense of storytelling, and oh, that dizzying dialogue. My girl's dying in a public hospital and I want her out. She's under arrest, Mr. Brown. What's the charge? Homicide. It's ridiculous. She wouldn't kill a fly. She'd try to kill herself. Is that a crime? It happens to be against two laws, God's and man's. I'm booking her under the second. When she hurts you again, baby, don't wait six months. You have nothing more to fear. You know that because you're perfectly sane. I'd rather be insane and alive than sane and dead. And the subject matter isn't the only manifestation of modern pastiche that the big combo unwittingly ratifies. Whereas everything from Bosch to Blade Runner features full-on sensuous saxophone music as an auditory augury to the blood and guts genre they supposedly hail from, as we've established previously, precious little noir actually features such. The vast majority scored contrary-wise with lush orchestral arrangements, or in the odd case of, say, Impact, which, like the big combo, stars film noir perennial player Brian Donlevy, even the odd theremin. Take care of yourself, softy. But the big combo, in willful subversion of its contemporaries, features full on jazz in multiple manifestations. <laughs> on drums. Real crazy. You like crazy drums, Lieutenant? But truthfully, it upholds nearly as many hallmarks of its film noir forebears as it bridles against, most noticeably that far from the wine-swilling cinemaphile pretense that's come to characterize contemporary interpretations of the period, the big combo was a B-film, and so with frequency was film noir in general. These were not for the most part multi-millionaire tentpole pictures featuring the latest and greatest gatslingers snarking their way through a scorching script. By and large, these were cheapies made to bolster up the bottom of the bill in a two-picture package. In the 40s and 50s, huge numbers of films were being made, and they were made either with large budgets, A-category films, or small budgets, and those were the B-films. I think young filmmakers then, that's how they learned to make movies. They were shuttled into the low-budget films, and they were given pretty much free reign because they were made under the radar completely. So they were, in a strange way, a creation of the distribution system in America. While star Cornell Wilde was by this time beyond B-films, even netting an Oscar nomination for his turn in A Song to Remember, the rest of the cast, Richard Conte notwithstanding, were B-actors arcing towards C. The lanky Lee Van Cleef making one of his earliest appearances as a streetwise assassin, whose implied homosexuality, to put it bluntly, is more an invention of modern revisionist social justice jackassery from journalists than any sincere 
sincere attempt to subvert the censors. Make no mistake, there most certainly are homosexuals in film noir, we've even covered a few, but the sad fact the San Fran sucky sucky cinema society have yet to swallow is that film noir had no shortage of tools to clue the audience in to said character's penile predilections. Sam Spade's first encounter with Peter Lorre in the Maltese Falcon includes an allusion to the saccharine scent he's wearing. Ditto for Lindsay Marriott in Murder My Sweet, with a further reference to him having a natural inclination for clothes shopping. Subtle? Yes. But this immortal iconography had been used by canny directors to convey the unspoken for over a decade by this point. And sadly for the Mullers and Eddie Robsons of the world, the big combo contains not one such illusion in the body text of the script. If two dudes bunking in the same room means they're ramming each other, what does that make Alan Ladd's war buddies in the Blue Dahlia, the village people? It was the 50s. People still possessed a modicum of maturity on the subject. Try doing likewise before projecting your trite 2018 gender standards on half-century-old cinema for a change. Not that a few quizzical dialogue and framing choices help the case for a rebuttal. Gotta eat something. I can't swallow any more salami. A few eyebrow-raising moments notwithstanding, both director Joe Lewis and writer Philip Jordan have since stated outright that the homoerotic subtext was utterly unintentional, with the latter going so far as to say he shot the script out absent any such implication and never gave it a second or third thought and describing it as, quote, hack work forever thereafter. Sound like a script he was looking to slide some socio-political pretense into? The likelihood he was hawking a homosexual agenda when Jordan didn't give a damn about the story at large? About as high as Alan Ladd at a Globetrotters exhibition. Sorry, Turner Classic Movies. Leading man wild for his part is a world-class underrated talent, particularly today, turning down a spot on the Olympic fencing team to pursue the craft. It was only while coaching the famed Laurence Olivier at sword fighting he was seized for the cinema. The rest, of course, is history. A five decade film career followed, during which his depiction of the strident moral defender, one that makes him unlikely in the morally ambiguous climes of crime fair, made him ideal for first bill fodder in a time of government mandated moral exactitude. It's precisely this earnest morality, albeit colored by personal flaws, like his meaningless liaisons with leggy nightclub showgirl Rita, that provide the requisite contrast. Your mileage may differ, but my favorite film noir by far focused not on the moral travails of a central character self-serving in the extreme as he's undone by his own graft, i.e. night in the city, but a concrete morality play where the good guy wears a black hat but is nevertheless unbending in the face of adversity, allowing the surroundings and the circumstances, in short, the setting, to take center stage, its proper place in a picture of this genre. Chandler defined it best. He described the film noir hero as a knight in dirty armor. In my own career, I've tried to, to redefine him as a knight in blood-caked armor. But he is still a knight. It's, he just it doesn't look like one. And he's never rewarded for what he does. He's this lonely character who's out there, and he's just bugged by stuff. And then there's Wilde's then-wife, Jean Wallace, who here is playing to type with aplomb. Whether it's art imitating life or the opposite, when Susan slumps into the arms of a former friend and announces... Susan. I've taken some pills. Susan. An eerie plot device given that Jean Wallace attempted the very same herself on multiple occasions, one of the many casualties of the cyclone of stardom. Fortunately, her marriage to the movie's star seemed to straighten her out some, and she lived to a retiring age, but they don't call this exploitation for nothing, and the ingenue's issues are inarguably splayed across the screen for all to see. Don't touch me! Go away. Please go you away. You think you're the bright, respectable girl you were four years ago. You're not. You attempted suicide. You're under arrest. You could be sentenced to jail for six months. Nurse, may I have some water, please? I live in a maze, Mr. Diamond. A strange, blind, and backward maze. And all the little twisting paths lead back to Mr. Brown. I can't buy that, Miss Lowell. Not in a million years. Why do you want to change my life, Mr. Diamond? My boss says I'm in love with you. I keep telling myself I'm just doing my job. 
Susan's resigned depiction of an utterly entrapped relationship as she yearns for freedom only to be drawn in perpetuity to the inescapable evil of the mysterious Mr. Brown is one of the more realistic of its type, and Wallace's accolades for the role are well earned for a fact, but there's still ambiguity on offer here, and as is so often the case in film noir, it materializes in the aspect of the antagonist, who goes from soaring soliloquies on the merits of murderous blood rage one minute. The best man won a night, Mr. Brown. You were better than Martinez. Only you threw it away. You step in the ring and shake hands with him. You want to be his friend, and you want to fight him. No, Benny, no. Now, Benny, who runs the world? Have you any idea? Not me, Mr. Brown. That's right, not you. But a funny thing. They're not so much different from you. But they've got something. They've got it, and they use it. I've got it. He hasn't. So what is it, Benny? What makes the difference? Hate. Hate is the word, Benny. Hate the man who tries to beat you. Kill him, Benny, kill him! Hate him till you see red and you'll come out winning the big money. What'd you do that for, Mr. Brown? You should have hit me back. You haven't got the hate. Tear up Benny's contract, he's no good to me anymore to choking back near sobs as he searches for the one thing his woman denies him, actual unencumbered affection. Where did you get that outfit? What's wrong with it? I like you better in white. You've got a dozen white dresses, why don't you wear them? White doesn't please me anymore. A woman dresses for a man, you dress for me, go put on something white. I won't. Fortunately, his deft reportage opposite Diamond leaves little doubt to his alignment, while his torturous exchanges with a former mom boss's flunky, the always brilliant Brian Donlevy, provides the capstone to one of the most inherently hateable adversaries in film noir history. Two seconds ago, you had this gun in your hand. We're all alone here. The thought of using it flashed through your mind. But you couldn't. If you didn't hesitate to use it on Dreyer, why? Because he was a little man, Joe. Like you, a little man. You got a soft job and good pay. Stop thinking about what might have been. And who knows? You may live to die in bed. It's befuddling to feature that the part was originally intended for the immortal Jack Palance, who was dropped the day before filming after butting heads with director Joe Lewis. Palance would have no doubt done a downright sensational job with the role, but it's the very ambiguity attached to the often heroic characters previously played by Conte that prevents him from degenerating into a cringy cartoon. I'll wait until I can put you on trial for murder. Who's murder, Lieutenant? Mine, if necessary. Don't push too hard. It's my sworn duty to push too hard. Diamond, the only trouble with you is you'd like to be me. You'd like to have my organization, my influence, my fix. You can't, it's impossible. You think it's money, it's not. It's personality. You haven't got a lieutenant, you're a cop. Slow, steady, intelligent, with a bad temper, and a gun under your arm. And with a big yen for a girl you can't have. First is first, and second is nobody. The studio that sired this seminal film is a Frankensteinian hybrid resulting from a hasty rebranding of former B-film foundry Monogram Pictures, renowned for so-called Poverty Row filmmaking, such as the Charlie Chan series and even sleeper standout Dillinger. Sadly, as B-Pictures fell out of favor, the oh-so-imaginatively retitled Allied Artists believed this rather callow attempt to rechristen themselves would allow them to pivot to more profitable, legitimate ventures. B-plus Pictures, as producer Walter Mirisch called them, going so far as brokering deals with box office barons like Howard Hawks and Humphrey Bogart to transition to proper AAA filmmaking. But with their reach exceeding their financial grasp, allied artists gradually settled into a kind of uncomfortable middle market role, producing films with outright unknowns or bankables on the backslide, and shoring up youthful audience numbers by pinching out films featuring controversial subject matter. The big combo is one such initial archetype of this approach, prominently featuring sordid subjects from its era, from matricide to torture to an infamous sequence of not-so-subtly-implied cunnilingus so brazen the Hayes office censors browbeat director Joe Lewis in person. Susan, what are you trying to do? Drive me bats? What do you want, Susan? Tell me. I'll give you anything you want. Tell me. Nothing. Anything at all. Nothing. 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 Not
not even particularly tame by today's standards, a fact that was driven home resoundingly when the very same director described to ingenue Gene Wallace precisely what he wanted for the scene, explaining the otherwise inexplicable union of the seemingly virtuous Susan to glorified thug Mr. Brown by stating, quote, No respectable man from Knob Hill is going to love you the way this gangster loves you. Gene, when this man takes you in his arms, he doesn't stop at kissing you on the lips. He covers you all. Gene Wallace was livid. How dare you, she shouted. Not even Cornell talks to me that way. Upon explaining this was in reference to her character, not an aspersion on her morality, Wallace at last withdrew, saying she understood, but adding, when I shoot this scene, please get Cornell off the set. I couldn't face him otherwise. How far we've fallen as a society since. Replace Gene Wallace with Scarlett Johansson and just try imagining a scenario where she keeps her clothes on. The result is an unintentional cornerstone of what would come to be known as the exploitation genre. What you'll find here is an ideal fit from perhaps the grittiest film genre known to man. You know, paraphrasing Alfred Hitchcock, and when, when he was talking about melodrama, he said that it was reality with all the boring parts taken out. Film noir is us our basic sexual, greedy, honorable, and evil natures. Naturally, when Wallace's husband, Cornell Wilde, at last saw the scene in the final film, he flipped. How dare you shoot a scene like this with my wife? How dare you? To which director Joseph Lewis simply shrugged and said, then show me what I've actually done. According to Lewis, the actor never truly forgave him. His defense, and not an entirely inaccurate one, being that those who interpret it as a reference to going down on a dame should not be shocked by it because the brain affixed to their dome drew said conclusion to begin with, and those who didn't would miss the inference entirely. The rest is up to the audience. Let them supply the emotion. Let them tell me where he went. Let them tell me what he's doing. There were three man board, if I recall correctly, and the first man to talk was a rather youngish guy who immediately lit into me like a 75 millimeter howitzer, you know, and, and said, how dare I shoot a scene as filthy as that? And, uh, and he accused me of everything, of having a filthy mind and all. I let him talk. And at the end of it, I said, excuse me, sir, I don't quite understand what you mean. I don't know what's wrong with dolling into a head close-up of a young lady. Now, please be more explicit. He's, well, tell me, where did Richard Conti go? Where, you tell me that, where'd he go? I said, I haven't the vaguest idea. He may have gone off the stage for a glass of water. I don't know. What are you referring to with my baby blue eyes, you know? Well... They allowed it. But therein lies one of the latent strengths of the film noir subset, and one that's sadly missing in modern crime films. The raw emotional power of suggestion. A bloody murder punctuated by a musical sting delineated in lurid detail with blood guts and gore gushing in all directions? Well, that's just a murder. One that's skillfully implied by what you can't see and instinctively turn away from as the scene reaches its lethal climax? That is a very personal horror half constructed in the audience's mind. Said suggestion being complemented in every way by the cinematography. Whereas the sparse set lighting of previous film noir efforts was unconscious in nature, informed by utility and expense rather than any explicit attempt to channel the darksome preoccupations of the subconscious. We didn't know it was film noir. I was just shooting a picture with a mood that I thought it needed. And, uh, and also would give me time to work with the actors and less time for lighting and more time for, for working with the people so that I could get better work out of them. And it worked beautifully, and thank God it caught on. By 1955, the year the big combo was unleashed, it was oh so intentional. And why wouldn't it be? As the film's cinematographer John Alton almost instinctually wrote the book on it. The literal book. Painting with light as close to a Bible for the film noir aesthetic as aspiring filmmakers are ever likely to find. But in my eyes, while other works such as He Walked by Night, The T-Men, Raw Deal, and hell, even the pilot for the original Mission Impossible, yes, he shot that too, sizzle with obscurity and savagery from reel to reel. The haunting silhouettes wreathed by frigid plumes of billowing fog, establishing every bit as much as any script the isolation, anger, and entrapment of the quintessential noir yarn. John Alton, despite a reputation that can be felt to this very day through the work of Ridley Scott, Roger Deakins, and even Lord of the Rings and 
Andrew Lesney was in fact a victim of his own success. So superb, and more importantly so fast, he utterly intimidated the cameramen he worked with to the extent he was sort of softly blacklisted for many of the more prominent studio ventures out of fear of the filmic genius that would immediately supplant them, leading to the low-budget B-fare that characterized so much of Alton's output. Many is the story of a director telling Alton to light a scene, and no sooner do they sit down to a scone and a newspaper than Alton returns with a bold utterance of the word, done. Infuriated, the director returned to the set to survey his slapdash work, only to be blown away by one of the most starkly beautiful and minimalist setups they'd ever beheld. The first location we went to, I didn't see any big lights. I just saw a couple of inkies and things like that, and it was in this underground kind of thing. I said, John, what, what's going on? He says, well, I don't use much light. I stop and do this and that with black and white. And, and sure enough, on the screen, it was gorgeous. He had the guts to use very little light, you know. But it had an effect of those days. That black and white was so beautiful that it was almost like it was painted. He was just that good. The Big Combo, perhaps more than any other classic period picture, is a visual feast in every frame. And best of all, said visuals labor in solemn service to the storytelling, such as this stunning sequence where two hired hitmen aim to assassinate Lieutenant Diamond and drop his side dame instead. It's open. Go. Go! You're so very welcome, Sin City. From the falling cigarette, to the dangling of a limp wrist, to the throbbing burlesque sign silently eulogizing the demise of one of its fallen children, this entire sequence screams film noir full stop. I think sometimes darkness is, is more beautiful than light. I think everybody has a certain sense, although they're not conscious of it, of how things change in the dark. And the greatest thing in the world happened at night. The good and the bad happens at night. The murders and the marriages and the love scenes all at night. But everything from the oft-celebrated airport climax to the opening sequence featuring Susan slathered in shadow, circumnavigating narrow maze-like corridors to evade her hulking pursuers are caringly crafted not merely for moodiness and visual style, but to evoke the labyrinthine web of unbridled entrapment that characterizes the Susan-Mr. Brown dynamic in its totality. Stunning shots to be sure, but wholly subordinate to the story. The conclusory scene at the airport, initially envisioned as a location shoot but later wisely with the benefit of hindsight, moved to a stage set that looks about 12 times as convincing, brings the psychic motivations of each character full circle. We had an airport to shoot. And um, he made a suggestion to me. Drape the stage in black velvet and we'll put a revolving light that goes around like so. And he said, you will have an airport, and I'll have it for you in about 10 minutes. Diamond is depicted throughout as noble but latently paranoid, ascribing the influence of Mr. Brown as omnipresent, bordering on omniscient, never illustrated more effectively than in the scene where he asserts Brown's culpability in base-level street crime utterly unrelated to the big combo, or even, for that matter, the plot. So, and I know his name. The name of a man who can pick up a phone and call Chicago and New Orleans and say, hey, uh, Bill. Joe was coming down for the weekend, advance him 50,000, and he hangs up the phone and the money is advanced. Protection money. The new all-night bar opens with gambling outside city limits. A bunch of high school kids come in for a good time. They get loaded, they get irresponsible. They lose their shirts, and they get a gun because they're worried, they want to make up their losses. And a filling station attendant is dead with a bullet in his liver. I have to see four kids on trial for first-degree murder. Look at it. First-degree murder because a certain Mr. Brown picks up a phone. You can't touch Brown. He's clean. You got nothing on him. Not even the parking. I mean, why is he so careful? It's unnatural. You can't tell the jury a man's guilty because he's too innocent to innocent. be natural. He's no more innocent than this gun. Oh, now stop getting emotional, Leonard. As Diamond unravels each morbid thread and pursues it to the downmeet denouement, the paranoid dynamic inverts, with a plucky police lieutenant uncovering leads in regaining confidence, as Brown's whirlwind of delusion leads him to lash out even at loyal subordinates, leading to the first of many reversals wherein Brian Donlevy's character, whose hearing aid was used to deafen Diamond, is not only double-crossed by Brown, but deafened for the duration. I 
feel sorry for you, Joe. So I'm going to do you a favor. You won't hear the bullets. Unbridled brilliance. By the end, the two have traded places whole cloth, the formerly inextricably ensnared Diamond exchanging his entrapment with Mr. Brown, who fruitlessly fumbles for a way out, only to slam into a literal wall. Perhaps even more poetic justice for the woman he subjugated, Susan, who looks stoically on as justice is meted out. Come on out, Brown. Jail, Mr. Brown. Not. You're not taking me to jail. You'll have to kill me first. Go ahead, shoot. Go ahead, kill me, copper. Kill me. Go ahead, kill me. Let's kill me. go, Oodlum. I won't go again. Although, when you really analyze it, arguably little to none of it can be put down to Diamond's brilliant detective work. Lieutenant Diamond is, in this sense, the apotheosis of the American gumshoe, who exchanges the preternatural deductive prowess of Sherlock Holmes and Poirot for a scattershot, slipshod, transgressive approach, barreling head-on into the baddies, yielding as many dead ends, not to mention back-alley beatings, as investigative viable leads. Perhaps no single sequence illustrates this more emphatically than the one featuring the famed radio torture. I only want to borrow it, Joe. Will Joey Cohen please look under... Watch your information. Arresting all my friends. Phony warrants. What's behind it? Bingo, try it. The result of an utterly uncalculated tactical blunder tendering flat zero results, culminating in needless setbacks for an otherwise upright character, controversial for its unflinching brutality in its day, said sequence was resurrected by God's own plagiarist Quentin Tarantino for Reservoir Dogs, whereupon it was equally controversial. I don't really give a good fuck what you know or don't know, but I'm gonna torture you anyway. You ever listen to K. Billy's? Super sounds of the 70s. It's my personal favorite. With swinging dicks, snarling hoods, and sensational cinematography abundant, the big combo is the poster child for the ascendance of the B-film noir, a movie that overperformed its own importance down the stretch after an initially lukewarm reception. It also happens to be one of the few film noir originally shot in a widescreen aspect ratio, which is why the Blu-ray release of the movie in question is, for once, eminently recommended. It's long since lapsed into the public domain, so you have little excuse not to pour a shot, light a cigar, and saddle up for film noir majesty. On a selfish note, it also happens to be my favorite of the genre as well. I'm Razor Fist. Don't get captured. so fast he wouldn't have time to change his pants. Tell him the next time I see him, he'll be down in the lobby of the hotel crying like a baby and asking for a $10 loan. Tell him that. And tell him I don't break my word. He must have done something pretty fine to get as high as you are, Mr. Brown. I'm looking into that. I'm going to open you up and I'm going to operate. I hate to think of what I'll find. <laughs> What I tell you, Joe? A righteous man, 